and welcome back. Now today we're going to be talking about a very small device, that one there, and it is in fact a TCA 9548A. What's that I hear you cry in unison? Well, it's a good thing you ask because I'm going to tell you all about it. Now what it is in fact is an I2C bus multiplexer and voltage level shifter or leveler at least. What does all that mean? Well, let's let's talk about the first things first, which is basically if you have an I2C bus which consists of just two wires, which is why it's called twin wire sometimes, two wires uh, connected to multiple devices and you can talk to any one of those devices on those two wires by saying, Oi, you over there with a hexadecimal address of 43, I want to talk to you next. And it will say, OK, what's the temperature? And it will say, uh, 23, and send it back. End of conversation. And of course, like these LCD displays here, um, they might be on address 27. So you say, Oi, I want to talk to you, LCD display, on address 27. Put LCD4 on the second line of your display. And it will say, fine, I've done it. Now that's all very well because the I squared C hex address of any of those devices is unique. And often when you buy devices, there are little tiny pads on the boards you can fiddle about with to adjust that hex address slightly. So that if you had a clash with some other piece of hardware, you could then change it to make it unique. Great. But what happens then if you have a device that has got one fixed hex address? which happened to me once, but for the life of me, I can't remember which one it was. It's a sensor. Normally sensors do this. Uh, so I'm going to emulate that and make it a bit more visual for you. We're going to pretend that these two LCD displays here have a fixed address of hex 03F. Now, they are indeed running on 3F, but I could, if I wanted to, change the address of one of them so I can have more than one of these displays running at a time. However, we'll assume, just for the purpose of this demo, that they are on a fixed address of 03F hex, and uh, I want to use two. How would you do it? Well, if you tried to connect two devices with the same hex address onto the R2C bus, well, all hell would break loose, frankly. You couldn't query a sensor to say, oi, sensor with a particular hex address, go and give me the temperature, because they both try and respond and just corrupt the signal. You just couldn't do it. And similarly, if you're sending stuff out on an I2C bus, if you said 0 hex 3 f display that on the line, either both would respond, you get everything on one of them, or you get some of the corruption. It just it's just is not the way I2C works. Now, I2C is very easy to use, and indeed the Arduino implementation of it is simplicity itself. But when you get that clash of addresses, then you're stuck, and you need this TCA 9548A chip, the one on here. Now, I have a much bigger picture of that rather than picking this up and uh, pulling the wires because I have to admit the um, the connections on one of these is, is a little bit dodgy and if I touch it too much, it just goes gobbledygook on the screen. So we'll just quietly leave them sitting there and I'll show you a nice picture instead. I'd like to give a shout out to LCSC Electronics, China's leading electronics components distributor, who are in fact just sponsoring this video. Our electronic components orders can be picked and shipped in just four hours, and you can pay by PayPal, various credit cards, American Express, or even wire transfer. And you don't even have to create an account if you'd prefer not to. Just check out as a guest on their easy-to-use website. If you do decide to create an account, though, you can use their new feature of account prepaying. I think I might try that soon. Try out their website now. Right, that's what it looks like. Um, now it's from Adafruit. Um, this is their implementation of it. Obviously, I don't know if there are other ones around. Probably, possibly. Um, it's a fairly easy chip to implement because at the end of the day, you have two wires coming into it. So on the input side, you've got SDA and SCL. These are the clock and data lines for your I2C bus. Two wires, that's all it is. And they connect to your Arduino's two wires, SDA, SCL. Now, I'm using the ones... Uh, on A4, A5 over here, but they're brought out normally on uh, separate pins as well and marked up as such. We'll have a look, closer look later. So that's it. That's all you need is those SCL, SDA lines, and this thing will start running. Okay, you need power. Okay, so at the top there, you've got V in, 
and ground. Now this device works from a very low voltage, something like 2.7 volts, I believe. We'll have a look at the data sheet a little bit later on. But basically it can run very, very low. But normally you'd run this device at the voltage of your microcontroller. So if instead of using an Arduino over there, I was using an ESP8266 running at 3.3 volts, that's exactly what I'd be bringing in to V in. So that's, that's fine, and this device itself is on hex address 70. And in fact, you can adjust that as well. You can go from hex 70 to hex 77. So yes, if you worked it out, you could in fact run eight of those on one I squared C bus. But this is, this is getting a little bit convoluted now. We'll just stick with the one for now. So what does this give you then? So this is running with that particular chip at hex 70 and it acts as a go-between it says okay i'll take everything you send to me and i will pass it to the channel that you say you want to talk to and that channel will stay in operation until you tell me another channel name you want me to talk to so in this particular instance what we're saying is that things get rooted down for example right at the top here we've got channel seven you can probably just make it out on there uh, the data and clock lines from here. So channel 7 is being given data down to here, and this does whatever it does with it. And then we say in the Arduino, I don't want to talk to channel 7 anymore now, I want to talk to channel 4. So this little device routes everything it gets in down to channel 4, and lo and behold it comes down here. And you've just now spotted the corrupt display I get on there because I've pulled the wires around. I think it's a, a bad soldering joint, or maybe one of my DuPont cables is a bit dodgy. But uh, we'll just quietly ignore that for the time being, I think. Otherwise we'll be here all day. Now, you do have eight channels here, starting from zero over here, zero, one, and then two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you can have eight devices hanging off here. And you might say, well, I don't often get I squared C hex address clashes. They're normally unique, and I can only want one, for example or there's something on the board itself that lets me change it and that is absolutely true so you can do that in which case you wouldn't need this but there's another little uh, string to this fella's bow which is we said that if we were using at the back there not an arduino but an esp8266 running at 3.3 volts so the voltage coming in at the top here would be 3.3 anything on one of these pins down here could be five volts they are all five volt tolerant which means that your devices running on an I squared C bus can all be five volts, but the chip itself runs on three volts. And indeed, remember that the, the actual microprocessor is connecting to these two wires up here, and the voltage on those would only be 3.3 volts. But all the other ones can be connected much higher. Cool, yeah. So that level shifting of the voltage the voltage level shifting there can be a real plus as we get into microcontrollers that are working their way down the voltage values the more we see them for for current consumption mainly and low power usage cool okay let's reset this and uh, talk about the data sheet now what the sketch i've got on here that running is simply a counter and i'm sending there are 100, the difference between the two counters is 100, and I'm sending the value of the counter incrementing first to one device and then the next device. So this one's counting up from zero, this one's counting up from 100. So I'm adding one, displaying it, switching the channel to here, adding one, displaying it, coming back to this one, changing the channel back to seven, adding one to the counter, displaying it, and so on. And I think that one's has that one gone funny? No, it's just the reflection of the light. Now, in real life, just so you know, these are lovely deep blue, really nice and easy on the eye. Unfortunately, because of the, the way videoing and TV generally works, they look very washed out in video, but don't be fooled by that for an instant. Now, these are also pretty cheap, just as an aside, so if you want to look at some of those, do so. Right, back to the, uh, the TCA9548 then, which is cheap, and it's from Adafruit. Let's see where I've got it from. Right, so I bought this from a UK shop, but obviously Adafruit sells all over the world and the price isn't going to be hugely different where you are. So I bought this one for £6.30 and I thought it's about time I gave back a bit to Adafruit, given that we've used quite a few of their libraries in these videos. 
and I wasn't going to spend $50 on one of their fingerprint sensors, for example, but spending £6.30 on their multiplexer seemed like a pretty good payback. Um, now, I've also bought another little item, which we might talk about at the end of the video, but let's not get sidetracked. So £6.30, this is from Pimeroni, but you can get it from multiple places, as I say, and if you're not in the UK, then I'm sure there are dozens and dozens of sites that sell Adafruit type um, hardware. So as you can see here, it's it's pretty small. Um, it doesn't require a lot of soldering up. The I squared C buses that it expands onto, so the, from zero, which is over here, all the way through to seven, do not have pull up resistors. So your devices that normally sit on the I squared C bus need pull up resistors. What's that? You're confused about I squared C buses, pull up resistors, and so forth. Okay. We'll have a diagram, shall we? Right, so let's talk about I squared C very, very briefly. If you'd rather not watch this bit, skip to the time marker in the video as shown on screen now, and you can skip over all this if you already know it or don't want to know it, and quite frankly, I don't blame you. Right, if you are still watching, then I squared C, even the name is deliberately made confusing. It's not really I2C like that, it's IIC which stands for Inter-Integrated Connectivity or Circuit. And it was invented by Philips back, I don't know when, in the 60s or something. And these days, everybody uses I squared C for two wires. So what have we got then? So we've got a clock wire running along the bottom. And we've got a, I haven't got a yellow pen, which is what I normally use. We have a data wire running across the top. Now, of course, it's the data that is perhaps more important but the clock is what keeps everything in sync let's worry less about the clock for the minute and worry more about what the data is doing on that chip now the first thing to remember we talked about pull up resistors it means this data line is being pulled up let's use a little thin pen is being pulled up to a plus voltage whatever it is it might be five it, it could be 3 volts 3, but whatever. And these might be 10k, they might be 20. It depends very much on the individual module. But the point is, this data line is at a positive potential. So when this feeds in to your UNO at this end, the UNO is very cleverly designed so that all it does is turn that data line down to ground it pulses it down to ground a certain number of times this is how i squared c can work at various voltages and there are no clashes so what does it mean to this line then if it's suddenly brought down to ground a few times well on that line you will get a series of pulses so from a, a plus voltage level suddenly it will drop to zero then go along a bit then rise again and so on so you get these pulses on here Okay, those pulses are all very well, but what are they doing? Well, they're talking to individual devices hanging off these two wires. So we've got the data wire, we have the clock, and they're going to your slave, which might be a temperature sensor, perhaps, right? Now, in this video, we're using an LCD, but let's keep it even simpler and use a temperature sensor. Now, the UNO knows that this device is on a particular address. Now, we've said um, 0 hex 27. So what this does is send down a particular sequence of pulses that this interprets as this is a command to address device hex 27. This then wakes up and goes, good Lord, that's for me. The next thing the UNO does is say, now give me your temperature which it does by a series of pulses like this and this interprets that as a request at which point this says ah now it's my turn to do this pulsing bit so this takes this line here and brings this line from a high down to low however many times it needs to do it and for various lengths like this and that is the reply back to the uno which it interprets as being ah, 31 degrees. So very, very cleverly, the whole thing works by bringing a data line down to ground. And as you might imagine, we spoke very briefly about the clock. When 
these pulses occur and when they don't occur is very much synced in to the clock that's running in the background all the time. So you can only start a pulse, say there, and you can only end it when it goes back up. So maybe there or there or there. And the length of that pulse will determine to the receiving station exactly what value you're trying to send. Now, if you look at the video that's uh, marked up on screen at the moment, this is shown in intimate detail because I, I put a data logger on the I2C bus to show people exactly how this works. And you can actually see individual values corresponding to letters coming out. So if you really want to get to grips with I2C, look at that. Otherwise, let's move on. Right, I hope that's made it a little bit clearer about how the I2C bus. Believe me, as a beginner, I mean, I'm remembering a few years back now, and it was in fact on pick chips rather than rather than Arduino stuff, but I2C was an absolute mystery and I had no idea how to start. But once I got into it and realised it was literally two wires and you just told it, you know, start, do this, end, it really was easy to do. And uh, this device would make it so much easier if you've got several sensors. Say, for example, you've got a temperature sensor with a fixed hex address. So you want one temperature for indoors, you want to put one outside the window, and maybe one in your aquarium. That's three sensors, but they've all got the same hex address. So what are you going to do? Obviously, you're going to use one of these, put them on their separate I2C buses, and then address each one in turn. Simplicity itself. And as you can see from my workbench, they all just, they all just work. They just run apart from the dodgy DuPont cables. <laughs> yes. Now on the back of this device, let's have a look at that. So this is underneath the board now. There are no components mounted there, but um, there are these little pads here that I told you about changing the hex address. So by default it's hex 70, but by putting a little solder bridge across these little points here, you can change that. A0 increments it by 1, a one increments it by two and a two increments it by four. What do we mean by that? Okay, your hex address 70 to begin with. If you were to put a solder blob across a zero, you've incremented it by one. So this will now be hex address seven one, not seven zero. If you thought, no, I won't do that, I'll put a blob across a two to increase it by four instead of seven zero, it would now be hex seven four. Pretty easy, isn't it? I and mean, if you put a blob against all of these, so you bridged each one of these, then you get up to 77, hex 77. And if you notice there, okay, it's upside down, but it says V in 1.8 volts to 5 volts. So it was in fact slightly less than what I said, but the actual I2C buses that this offers can be 5 volts, even if it's running at 1.8, which is great. That level shifting can be quite an issue for I2C products on low powered microcontrollers and this definitely addresses that. The other thing that it says on the back here, just to cover this in, in complete detail, it says cut this little track between these pads here and here if you want the pull-up resistors on this device not to be in effect. Now as we mentioned previously, if you have too many I2C products hanging off your I2C two wires, each with their own pull-up resistor, you're going to pull it up too much basically, you'll never be able to pull it back down again. So by cutting it, cutting these little tracks here, you can say I only want one set of pull-up resistors, thank you very much, and that's being dealt with by another device. If you don't want them on here as well, just cut them and that's it. The I2C voltage on that bus will be sufficient for everybody to see the way it's being pulled back down. And as you can see, there's a United States America quarter dollar there just for a size, but you'll probably see that better on my workbench anyway. It is, after all, pretty small, isn't it? Now, if you thought, hmm, I could probably build that into my project, but I don't really want that board. I don't want an Adafruit board. I just want the chip. Well, you can do that as well. Let's have a look uh, where you can get them from and how much they might be. So here's LCSC's uh, warehouse catalogue, and they sell it for the grand total of 85.11 cents, less than a dollar each, which is pretty good going, isn't it? And that's for multiples of one. Obviously, the price drops like a stone, as you can see over here. Um, if you were to buy 10, for example, it goes down to 63 cents and so on. All right Now, you could easily make a PCB as part of your main project and just slot one of these in to give you 
those multiple I squared C buses. And even if you didn't want all seven, because obviously this is a the board we're using from Adafruit as a demonstration board to give you all of that. But if you thought, well, I only want two or three of those buses, well, just leave the others uh, not connected anywhere on your PCB. Sounds pretty simple. The actual PCB design and, um, well, reference design, I suppose almost you'd call it, is available in the data sheet. As you can see, there's a Texas Instruments uh, data sheet here. So let's have a look at that. Now, this is a lovely data sheet. I mean, I like data sheets anyway, I must admit. They're usually written really well and they just tell you everything, even though I would say probably about 50% of it goes above my head because I'm not really interested in a lot of the nitty gritty electronics under the hood. But in this case, this one is really good read. And if you think, I want to read up about this, you can learn an awful lot. Now, it says down here, for example, the operating power supply voltage is between 1.6 to 5.5. That's interesting, isn't it? The Adafruit one actually says 1.8. And it's 5 volt tolerant inputs. And the clock frequency can anything be from zero. Well, it's not going to be from zero. Normally, the I squared C frequency standard, well, I think they call it slow these days, is 100 kilohertz. Fast clock frequency is 400, as it says here, but you can get it up to something like 3.2 meg in some instances, but obviously not here, 400, plenty fast enough for, you know, sense interrogation and even updating my LCD um, displays. Um, well, I'm not going to go through all this, but uh, let me just show you a couple of the, the reference designs a bit further down about PCB and circuit design. Well, actually, just before I get that far, you notice there's this nice little modular diagram here, very similar to the one we've previously seen, where you have this bit over here is your microcontroller talking to it on these two lines here with its VCC and ground, and then everything else is nicely separated over there. Cool. That's exactly what we want. Right. Let's have a look at the reference design. Right, so this is a fairly typical application, it says up here. Um, it almost sort of just expands on what we just looked at. You have your microcontroller here on the I squared C two wire buses here um, with pull up resistors if you want them. And it does also give you the opportunity to put a reset pin in. If you want to reset this at any time, what happens then if you bring this pin here on the TCA9548 low? It resets it and disconnects all of these. They're all disconnected instantly. And then you can start again talking to it. And here we have a layout example. If you were to put this on a PCB, for example, it describes here in a little bit of detail how it might work best, which is um, something you probably do want to read if you're going to put this into one of your projects. I don't think there's anything massively complicated about it or complex for that matter. It just... I don't know, it clarifies a couple of things, you know, things like bypass capacitors and where perhaps you want pull-up resistors or not. Okay, right, let's have a look at the sketch then that uh, you can use. There are two sketches, one, they're both based on Adafruit's one, one for scanning the I squared C addresses of anything you do connect to these external buses here, and then the one I use to display my values on my LCDs. Right, so this is the our, um, Adafruit's version of the code. I did have to change it, I've got to be honest. Now you can see this was written in 2009, so maybe things have changed since then, or at least on the I squared C bus, I don't know. But anyway, I had to make a couple of changes to enable the scanner to work correctly. So I'll put this up on my GitHub, and it's, it's basically the way the scanner works. You say to the TCA device, right, start, I want to talk to channel zero. It goes, okay, everything you send me from now on is going to channel zero until you tell me otherwise. So on channel zero, you go, right, channel zero, is there anything on hex address zero? No. Is there anything on hex address one? No. Is there anything address? Okay, you get the idea. And eventually it works its way up the, the address value. And eventually it might say, is there anything on hex address EF? And it goes, yes, I'm here. And that's all you need to know. So this scanner tells you then what there is on those addresses. We'll have a look at that in uh, a second. Right, we're going to run the scanner program then. Let me bring up the debug window, aka serial monitor, and we'll see exactly what it comes up with. Right, there it is. It's running. So it's, it's scanning each one of those ports. And when we get to port 4, there we are, it's found something. And when we get to port 7, it's found something. I mean, that's pretty quick, isn't it? And I've slowed it down quite a bit, actually, just so that it didn't whiz through in a nanosecond. 
So it scanned each one of those additional I squared C um, buses or ports, as it says here, found the correct item, my screen, on port four and found another one on port seven. Same address, but we don't care because these are all independent I squared C buses. Cool. Well, there we are. That's the end of the scanner. I'll put the uh, I'll put this this code of what it's worth up on the GitHub, and you might like to use it. And as I say, I did have to change um, the way it worked compared to the Adafruit one. Not that the Adafruit one is is wrong or anything. It just just didn't work anymore. Okay. Right. So here's the code that's actually running currently on my workbench, updating these two LCD uh, displays, which once again is totally corrupt. That bottom one. Just quietly ignore that for the time being. Yeah, I know I'm going to have to really sort that one out. Anyway, so what we're doing then is displaying on two independent displays with the same hex address, same I squared C hex address, right, which normally isn't possible. So let's have a look at the code, step through it fairly briefly. There's not a lot to it, really. Now, yes, this is written in Eclipse, not Arduino land IDE, but uh, that's because I was interested in how Adafruit had built their library, so I was digging into that a little bit, and this lets me do it. So let's uh, just whiz through, this will work absolutely perfectly on an Arduino IDE. Right, first of all then, uh, the the address of both LCD units is hex 3F. Uh, I'm creating two objects here using the liquid crystal I squared C, which you've probably seen in previous videos using that LCD, very easy to do. Um, as I say, the good thing about the Arduino IDE is it, it does push all the complexity of I squared C to the background, so you don't even know you're using it half the time. Now, obviously, you have to have this include wire dot H for the I squared C, which incidentally Arduino recognised that they had called it wrong. They should have called it twin wire, but by then it was far too late, so they just call it wire. So that is the I squared C twin wire. So anyway, we're declaring two objects then here for each of the LCD displays. Um, that's just a routine we're going to be calling to display the value to the LCD. I forward declare it here as it's called, because otherwise my Eclipse gets a little bit annoyed at me saying, Oi, what's this? I don't understand. So what we're um, doing here, this bit here is um, Adafruit code. And um, yeah, I should have rewritten this in slightly simpler format because obviously if you're a beginner, you're going to wonder what on earth this is doing. But we can quickly go through this. What we're saying is if we want to talk to, say, channel 4, so you're saying TCA channel and you've got number 4 in here, in I, what this is saying is, right, I want to talk to the device that is on hex 70, which, as we've already talked about, is in fact this device itself, right, by default it's on there. And we're saying the very next thing you're going to tell it is which channel you want to talk to on the I squared C buses. So if you've got four in here, we're going to bit shift number one four places to the left. Yeah, it's binary mucking about basically, and I think it would have been easier for me to explain if I just use an if statement on here. But this is how you would write it. So if you're interested in how this bit works, I will talk about this right at the end of the video, but not now, we don't want to get um, sidetracked. So this is how you talk to the actual TCA unit itself. Uh, in the setup, all we're saying is there's the my debug, but actually I don't think I've got anything written out to the bug, so... Oh, okay, I was playing around with the uh, twin wire, I squared C, squared C clock frequency. If you notice the... Um, the data sheet did say anything from 0 to 400k, but I was trying out all sorts of things. It's actually running at 10k at the moment. Well, I think it is. So here, we're saying, Oi, TCA unit, I want to talk from now on to channel 7. And that's all you do. And the TCA 9540 out, you go, alright then, everything you send me from now on, I'll push down the wire to channel 7. So then I can talk to my LCD on the end of it as though that TCA unit weren't even there. It's all transparent. It's brilliant. I can say, right, initialize that LCD unit, please. Clear it and remove the cursor. I don't want no big fat flashing cursor on there. Great. So we do that. And then we say, oi, TCA unit, everything I tell you now is going to go down to channel 4. And it goes, okay, whatever. 
And then we do the same for the second LCD unit, LCD2. We go initialize it, clear it. I don't want a big fat cursor. Uh, oh, and I want the backlight on. OK, I didn't need that. It's on by default. And then we have a little pause just so that we can see the fact that the displays are clearing. And then we go into the main loop. Now, all the main loop does is have two counters, one starting at zero, one starting at 100, and they're static, which means they're declared initially, but then effectively taken out of this loop, so they're not reset every time. And the scope of these values is can only be seen from this bracket here to this bracket here. You can't get them anywhere else unless you pass them as a parameter, which we are going to do. So what we say is, I'm going to call this routine down here to display the value on the LCD and I go, right, I want the object for LCD 4, for channel 4, here's my object and I want the temperature 2 displayed, which is this one here. Yeah, okay, this was an old routine that I'd written for temperature and I just kept a temp. It doesn't mean temporary, it means temperature. And then we do exactly the same for the device on channel 7 and then we increment it have a small delay of a tenth of a second and whiz around there. And the display for each device is simplicity itself. We switch to the channel we've been asked to switch to on that parameter, which is the first one here, or the four or seven. So we switch to that channel, send some values and instructions via the LCD command. And uh, well, that's it. And you, you can see what I'm sending. I'm sending the value, the counter, then on the next line, setting the cursor to column 0, line 1. We start at 0, remember. And LCD, the ch channel number, and then the value. So if we just whiz back to the workbench. So what you can see down here is the value being printed on the top line. And then LCD, the channel number, and then the counter again just so that we can prove that it's it's reading the data for this channel and not printing the value for something over here. That says 7. All right. Now, in this example, yes, the entire line is printed every single time, which is a bit wasteful. In terms of speed, what you would normally do is, say, position the cursor at this point here and just print out this number, because this bit never changes. But for this demo, we're printing everything each time just to prove that we're printing the right information and that sort of brings uh, this video to an end really i mean the, the displays here are now frozen because we've obviously got a different sketch loaded up um, i'll put some more details um, after this at the end of the video but if you want to sort of break off now you can and uh, i'll put all the data sheets and everything else that you might be of interest to you if you're going to use this and uh, thanks for watching and if you want to know more details stay tuned Good, you're still here. Right, okay. Now, we said we're going to look at a couple of other things at the end of the video, so let's do that now. Now, one of the things we said was that most Arduino boards bring out the SDA and SCL, that's the serial data serial clock lines, to separate pins on the Arduino board. So although I'm using A4 and A5 for my signal, so the SDA is the yellow one here on A4, and the clock is the green one on A5, very often you get them coming out on separate pins, which I'll show you up there. So on this board they're brought out at the top there, look, you can see SCL and SDA, and even in the middle there, there's, um, once again, you see it says there, SCL and SDA, which means these two pins at the end here, the green and the yellow again, to keep in with the colour coding I've used in this video, they're all brought out. Now this isn't always the case, you don't always get them out here, and you don't always get them at the top, but mostly, mostly you do. So there we are. And the other thing we said we'd cover is uh, what's all this about then, where it says wire dot right one left left i. Right, this is all binary um, arithmetic, really. It's really simple, but it just looks difficult. So let me get a board and show you how that works. Right, we're going to limit this bit to talk about this and only this, where i is a number that we've passed in for the channel number. So it can only be from 0 to 7. Now, this value that we're passing down the I squared C bus to the TCA device is a single character big. So therefore it's eight bits. So let's draw them out first. Right, so there we have our eight bits, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, and this is equivalent to one character or a byte. Okay. Now normally if this was all set to zeros, 
the value that is, then of course the the total value of the byte would be zeros and we're not sending any value out at all, which doesn't help. So what this is saying here is send out the value of one. So let's write that in quickly down here. And shift it to the left, however many times we've been told to here. Now, if you're shifting it out on channel zero, of course, it's not going to shift it at all. So you'll end up with a value of zero, 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 one. And that's what gets shifted out to your TCA device. So the TCA device says, oh, it's channel zero one because that's the only one with a one in it. If, however, you say I want to talk to channel four, we've got to move this four times to the left. So the one is in here initially, so we move it once, twice, three, four times. So now this value is zero, zero, zero. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, so we've moved it four times to the left. And as you can see, it's now on the channel four position. So by sending this value out, the TCA will say, ah, you want me to switch on channel four. Isn't that simple? Now we could, of course, just sent out the correct channel number. But this is because it's got to be in one byte and it's all bit position that determines which channel the TCA is going to send to, this is the way we'd normally do it. And all this means move to the left. And this is the single value of one that we are moving to the left x times. Simples. OK, I hope that's cleared that up. Right, and the final thing we said was what else did I buy from Adafruit? Right, so this is what I bought as well. It's called an Adafruit Trinket. And it's a bit like an AT Tiny 85 on steroids and speed at the same time. And it's uh, quite a powerful little chip. Now it's only got a few uh, GPIO pins, as you can see around the outside. There you got, apart from the ground, and it does say battery, so it's designed for low power usage. Uh, three, four, it's got a reset, and on the bottom line, it's got three volts, two, one, zero, and a USB one. Now I'm going to play about with this and tell you all about it in a future video, but I just thought uh, you'd like to know about this. It's only about seven pounds something like that which for an 80 tiny 85 type device would be a bit expensive but considering this you can do an awful lot more in terms of you know grunt work it's probably worth looking at in more detail not least because it runs micro python damn i've told you it now oh there'll be no surprises soon in any of my videos anyway so that's the trinket m0 uh, for a future video and that really does bring us to the end of the video now um, I hope you find it uh, useful and enjoyable. Don't forget to put comments down below. Give it a thumbs up if you think it's worthwhile. Uh, follow the affiliate links if there are any. Can't, can't remember quite honestly. And uh, see you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.